All right, so today we're going over two-aged silvicultural systems uh, focused on the regeneration methods. And we're gonna focus on both deferment and reserve systems uh, all in one lecture. Um, and there's a lot of similarity here. And I know that the two-aged systems tend to cause more confusion. Um, and there, there isn't broad agreement on this terminology. That's part of it. Uh, we haven't done a good job coming up with standard terminology like we have for the even age systems. Those even age systems, the terminology is very standard, little debate there, but people call these two age systems all sorts of different things. So just keep in mind as we're going through this, worry a little bit less about the specific definitions here and more about how you're linking the landowner objectives with what you're gonna be doing silviculturally. Um, so these are really tools to help you meet a blend of landowner objectives or more complex landowner objectives. And so as we look at our two age systems, we're talking about our regeneration treatments. Um, and we're really gonna focus mostly on economics and ecology, but of course these are often done for various societal factors, aesthetics being a, a big one. And so if you look at how this diagram is set up, we've been using this, it's right out of the useful handouts packet. Um, you see that those two age systems are listed a little bit differently than the uneven age systems are, and they're listed a little bit differently than the even age systems are, uh, in that they span you know, a distance there across multiple columns. Uh, that's done intentionally because that's how we use these systems. And so deferment is under seed tree and shelter wood there. So deferment is a modification of either, either the seed tree or the shelter wood system. And we've now seen seed tree, you want a lot of light on the forest floor, leave a few trees to produce seed. Shelter wood, we want shade on the forest floor leave a lot of trees to produce both seed and shade. And so we've talked about how typical applications of these involve two harvests. The first harvest leaves the trees in the older cohort. The second harvest removes them, releasing the younger cohort that's regenerated. All deferment is, is don't go back and remove the older cohort in that final harvest in three years. Don't go back and do it in five. Don't go back and do it in 10. Do it much later in the rotation so that for a lot of the rotation, you're dealing with a two age stand. So you can't have a clear cut with deferment because in a clear cut, you're pretty much cutting everything. So deferment means waiting. There's nothing to wait to harvest because you just cut everything. So that's why deferment's not under clear cut there. With reserves is a much more flexible modification. So you can have a clear cut with reserves, a seed tree with reserves or a shelter with reserves. So all these systems are just a modification of the even age systems that we already know where you're leaving something out there and you're doing it for a reason. So, so with these, you gotta keep in mind, think about the two age stand we were out in the very first day of lab. That was a seed tree with deferment. And we saw that you didn't have many trees in the younger cohort under those big trees in the older cohort. And we saw that some of those trees in the younger cohort were smaller than you might expect in an even age stand. So when you manage with a two age system, that suppression effect where the older cohort is suppressing the younger cohort because they're both out there is almost always gonna result in less timber production than if you were to manage an even age stand, okay? And when I say less timber production, we're talking volume. You're gonna get fewer tons per acre or cubic feet per acre off that stand over a rotation of the same length. But timber's not your key objective, so that's okay. You're not trying to maximize timber. This isn't like the land we were on in lab this week where you know it was managed by a company and their objective was maximizing financial gain. That's not the objective when you have a two-age system. You've got those blend of objectives and that makes it okay to lower timber production because timber's not all you want out of that forest. So with a clear cut, you may have one objective for that forest, okay? With these systems, you all, almost always have more than one objective. And so when we look at some examples of deferment, often uh, during a, in the field field station, we'll go to this stand here on the right. Um, it's uh, just Northwest of Broadus. And so that's an example of a forest service property where they have a two aged longleaf stand out there. So it would be an example of a seed tree with deferment. Um, and so again, all you're doing is taking a seed tree or shelter wood and definitely delay the removal cut. That's it. So. Um, it's even simpler than the seed tree or the shelter would operationally, because it usually just requires one harvest. Yeah, Hunter. Why do you 
So for it to be a two-age stand, you know, we're thinking about probably more than half the rotation length, um, because if you go in there and you harvest it before that, for the majority of the rotation, it might be an even age stand. And another way to think about this too, is you leave those large trees. So let's think about a shelter with deferment. So you cut maybe 60% of the canopy in an even age stand, you get a new cohort regenerating, you grow both of them. In that case, we need it to be shade tolerant species that we want, because otherwise you're not gonna get desirable species in the new cohort, right? And then you take them out, say you're on a normally an 80 year rotation, you may take them out with little thinning or any other treatments for 40 years, so half the rotation length. And then what you can do is you can go back in there and you can remove the oldest cohort, um, which you know could be well over 80 by this point. Um, and the, the younger cohort at that point, they're still pretty good sized trees. They're 40 years old. But when you remove that older cohort, you've opened up growing space on the forest floor. And so what was the younger cohort now becomes the older cohort and can start seeding in a third cohort. And so in that way, it's kind of always two aged if you think about going in at about half the rotation. Length. So that's an example that they've tried out in the Southern Appalachians with species like Northern Red Oak um, and had worked with some success. And so that's one of the key advantages of this in areas with longer rotations and where you're trying to grow quality timber is that by leaving that overwood, where again, it may be 40% of the stand. So it's like a really, really heavy thin you're going to get really good growth on those trees that you left. Okay. And they're hopefully your highest quality trees. And so now instead of waiting 80 years to get quality saw timber in a clear cut and going back or a shelter wood or one of these other systems, every 40 years, you get good quality saw timber off the stand. It may be less saw timber, but it's coming, you know, at half the interval. So it may be worth doing. So, so that, that's, that's an example where you could use this for timber, where you're trying to manage cash flow. So there's kind of two ways we can think about how we manage a forest from a timber standpoint um, in terms of finances. So you can do like the companies do and you can try and maximize return on investment. Okay, where you're using treatments, you're calculating the ROI, the return on investment on them. You're spending $100 today to yield you $125 in five years or something like that. So you're maximizing return on investment. If you're dealing with family forests or non-industrial private forest land, they often don't necessarily need to maximize that return on investment because there are no shareholders. And so they don't have that fiduciary responsibility to maximize financial gain for shareholders. Uh, instead, they may just be more interested in cash flow. Okay. Uh, they've got, you know, kids going to college, they've got, you know, payments on a house. And so what they're interested in is the cash flow coming from their forest. Um, to help them manage their lifestyle. And so with that, you don't have to necessarily yield a specific, you know, we're targeting a 10% ROI and up. You can just say, you know, we need $30,000 in year 2025. We're looking for $20,000 in this year. And you can manage cash flow. The landowners can be very happy with how their forest is being managed. And, you know, it, it you know, frees up some of the constraints you may be under if you're trying to maximize financial gain. So lots of different ways we can think about timber management there. Okay, so here's some of the confusion with deferment. You'll see it in the literature as the leave tree, the reserve tree, the irregular shelter wood that we already talked about. No one can agree on the name for what we're gonna call these systems. So that builds in some of the confusion there. And this is one of the more confusing sections in our regen treatment unit. Here's an example in longleaf pine. So where in the rotation are we here? So they've done the establishment cut um, and they may be done out there for quite a while. Um, of course, with longleaf pine, you may be looking at doing intermediate treatments like prescribed burning. Um, you may still in this example need some herbicide treatments um, if you do end up with you know, a lot of competing vegetation. So you may still need other treatments, but you're not looking at going back and doing another harvest in there for 20 or 30 years, probably at a minimum. So. Um, we talked about a pre-commercial thin and a seed tree and how that can be real important. But in these systems, you may not need them because that overwood 
and the shade it's producing will cause more mortality and will kind of give you some similar effects to what you would see a pre-commercial thin doing on that younger cohort. So you're gonna end up with the trees that are just in the right spots, you know, right in the middle between all the parent trees. Those are gonna win out, everything else is gonna be suppressed a little and so that'll get you through stem exclusion faster. You don't end up with that whole cohort completely the same height and they stagger. So, so you probably don't think about thinning these two age systems nearly as much as you would an even age system. Here's an example of a deferment system in Doug fir out in Oregon. Um, and again, aesthetics is a big deal out there in that mountainous terrain. So they were using it for aesthetics. And then we got to think about some different things with the residual trees. So we didn't talk about this as much with seed tree or shelter wood um, because you only need to leave those trees out there for three years, five years, 10 years. But here now, if you're thinking about leaving these trees out there for 20, 30, 40 years, you need to make sure that, you know, they're going to be pretty good trees that you hope are going to be increasing in value and having a high chance of survival. Um, and so here you want the right species, you want the right stem form, you want them wind firm, you don't want to pick trees that have rotted them already, dead tops, because they're just not going to be there 40 years from now, right? And then the other thing you have to think about is you're leaving them for much longer. So you need them young enough that they're not going to get into an age uh, where they, you know, start becoming much more susceptible to insects, disease, and other issues. But then the other thing you have to think about, and we haven't talked about this much yet with seed tree or shelter wood, mills will only take trees that are so big, okay? Uh, the debarkers, the other equipment they have in the mill can only handle a log so large. And so a lot of mills have maximum tree sizes of 24 inches in diameter, 28 inches in diameter, something in that range. So if you go out and you leave a bunch of 18 inch DBH trees in that first harvest, and you're counting on 30 or 40 years later going back and harvesting them, well, I mean, they could well exceed the mill size limits. Of course, you're also guessing what the mills in your area are going to look like in 30 or 40 years, which who knows. <laughs> but the trend in our mills that we've seen over the last 50 years is they're getting better and better and better at making large dimensional products with smaller trees. So that's the whole mass timber movement. We're now We've got the plant down east of Angelina or east of Lufkin there in Angelina County where they can basically take two by fours and manufacture crane mats instead of taking larger trees, uh, which is what we've traditionally been doing. So, you know, we used to just have plywood where you would take good sized pines, peel them, put the panels together, make plywood that's, you know, going on as the sheeting on your roof. Now we have oriented strand board where you can chip up smaller trees, glue them all together. And so we're, we're, we've been trending for a long time to make bigger products out of smaller trees. So that's kind of your guess, but at the same time, you have mills like in our area, Caltex, just south of the loop here, where they take big trees and they can saw larger saw timber out of it. So your hope as you're growing these trees is there's still some mill like that that'll take large trees um, and make large dimensional products out of them because that's going to be a higher value typically. So you may need to leave them a little smaller than you would think about in a typical seed tree or shelter wood, depending on the situation. You may even want to leave pole class trees. So again, remember pole doesn't mean utility pole here. That's a tree that's not saw timber size yet. It's some size between a sapling and saw timber size. And so it may be, you know, a small to large pulpwood tree, but it's only a pulpwood tree because of its diameter. The form is good, the species is right. It looks like it can grow into good saw timber. So, so that, that's a little bit different than what we think about in terms of the trees we retain if we're going to come back and get them pretty quickly. Here's an example of just how fast those trees can grow. So what you see up there is part of a white oak cookie, so a cross section of white oak. And you can see some arrows on there pointing to those sharpie drawn lines. And those sharpie drawn lines are showing you 10 years of growth in between each of them. And so you can see this tree, you know, it grows pretty slowly for 20 years, starting at the pith and working our way out. Then it grows a little faster for a decade. Maybe that stand was thinned. Maybe a tree next to it blew down. You know, it got more resources for a period. Maybe those were just years with ideal climate. So it could have been a variety of different factors. But then you can see, you know, it's growing slow, growing slow, growing slow. And then look what happens after they do the establishment cut in a shelter wood here the diameter growth rate goes way, way up. And if that is happening on a straight bowl, 
on the butt log of a tree that's already self pruned well, you don't have knots in it, it's clear wood, that's gonna be really high value wood you're producing there. Um, and so you've got all the other objectives, but it can also help you, not with the volume of timber, but with the quality of timber using these two edge systems. It'll produce high quality timber, so. There's some downsides to these deferment systems, and we've already talked about most of these. You know, you're gonna suppress the younger cohort. If you're trying to do this with a shade intolerant species, we've already seen that. That's that seed tree with deferment stand we were out on in lab one. So you're gonna get a lot of suppression on the younger cohort. So this works best where you have an intermediate or shade tolerant species, and those don't tend to be our most valuable species in the South. We do have a lot of our oaks in that intermediate shade tolerance category. So we could get this to work with oaks, but you know, our pines and our other species, they're less well suited to this because you know, cottonwood, other desirable species we want are on the intolerant end of the spectrum. So, and then of course, everything we talked about with shelterwood and seed tree applies here. Uh, you may get epicormic branches, your seed trees or your overwood may degrade over time. You know, uh, there, there's lots of different things that could happen. Okay, so any questions on deferment? So just keep in mind, deferment is a specific modification of a seed tree or shelterwood system, okay? If you're talking about anything else, you're talking about reserves, okay? So deferment is just one specific modification of a seed tree or shelterwood. Uh, reserves are therefore much more flexible. Um, so you can add these to any other silvicultural system um, and they're going to be trees that are left for some purpose beyond timber. And so you could also be leaving dead trees. Of course, if all you leave is dead trees to add more structural complexity, that may not be a two age stand, right? So you can retain dead trees. It meets your objectives. Great. That may not make it a two age stand if you don't also retain living trees. Um, I took this photo a couple years ago out in Oregon, and this was an example where they retained some of these live large Douglas firs. This was a mixed Douglas fir grand fir stand near Corvallis. Um, and so they retained some live trees and then some of the, the trees that were of that size class on the right that you see that they left, um, they topped them 50 feet up in the air. So they were intentionally creating snags. Um, I've seen examples up in New England where they're trying to mimic structural attributes of old growth forests um, where they will actually use the dozer in, or a skitter um, or get a dozer out there in a logging job, and they'll just pull some trees down to create tip-up mounts, pit mount topography. Um, or, you know, you can always go girdle a living tree, and that'll kill it gradually and create a snag for you. Um, you could do it with herbicides, but usually if you're doing something like this, um, you know, you, you're probably trying to manage that for some structural component for some wildlife species, something like that. Um, so in those cases, herbicides may not be the most desirable tool, um, depending on the population, the human population you're working with. So here's a couple different examples of clear cutting with reserves. And so at the top, you can see they retain what, maybe 10% or less of the stand just in one little corner, you know, so there, maybe they wanted to do a clear cut, but they're, you know, the landowner had a house near the property and they still wanted to cut some firewood periodically or something. Um, if you fly in a plane into Chicago and you fly over Indiana, or lots of places out in the Midwest, you know, it would be cornfield with those tiny little woodlots left to harvest firewood. So same sort of idea. Um, but there you can see very little reserves on the top. Look at the bottom. They retained about half the stand in reserves. Okay. So you can see these two stands could both be called a clear cut with reserves but they're clearly targeted towards landowners that have two very different objectives. The landowner on the top really wants timber and has a minor second objective. The landowner on the bottom has a pretty even balance between timber and something else as an objective. Yeah. So would SMZ count as a reserve or is that just It can serve a lot of these same functions. Okay, in that case, you're leaving it primarily to preserve water quality. Um, in some states, so up in Oklahoma, you're allowed to cut pretty much all the pine off an SMZ, even if you drop below the target basal area, because what they're trying to do is shift the composition of those SMZs back to hardwood. 
to get more hardwood out on the landscape, which would have reflected more of the condition before a lot of pine was planted in Southeast Oklahoma. Um, and so that may be meeting objectives beyond just water quality. So SMZs are doing the same thing we're talking about with reserves in many cases, but no one's calling them reserves when we, we do it. You're just doing a clear cut and then you've got a note on your prescription form that you're talking about with the logger about leave SMZs, we're following BMPs here. So often when an industry forester goes out to work with a logger that they're contracting to do a job, they may have one form with the prescription, they've got the maps, they wanna show the logger and everything like that. And then often they'll have uh, either on that form or on a separate form, they'll have the BMP guidelines uh, where the logger knows they have to shut down logging if it gets too wet so they don't rent the site, um, where the, the deck locations and everything, they often aren't specified, but they will say, you know, don't put them near the streams. Um, they may put notes in there about stream crossings if needed. And then what they'll do is they'll put notes in there about SMZs and how they're going to leave the SMZs. And they'll identify, they'll have the foresters who've gone out on that property. Who knows nowadays they may be using drones. A lot of them are still doing boots on the ground, but they'll be out there and they'll say, there is an ephemeral seep right here. And under Texas BMPs, you do not have to leave an SMZ on an ephemeral creek or stream, but they may say, we're gonna leave an SMZ on this. You can always do more than BMPs. And then often what the foresters will do, they may mark SMZs with paint um, or many of the companies, they've got a bunch of different kinds of flagging in their truck and they'll have one color flagging and it may even have SMZ printed on it and they'll go flag off the SMZ so the loggers can see when they get close to it. Because it may be a little hard to tell if it's an ephemeral creek or something like that. Um, so no one around here is calling a clear cut with SMZs, a clear cut with reserves. You could low if you wanted. Uh, I wouldn't do that with a logger out here. You're gonna cause confusion. So there's an example on Doug Fur up in Canada, uh, and you can see the little patch of reserves sort of the, to the top right of the photo. That's like that example on the top on the last slide where they've got this little habitat lifeboat. So, you know, when, when you look at large mammals like deer, elk, you know, moose, they can just walk out of a clear cut. And so that would be for, you know, smaller animals, very small mammals, birds, uh, you know, herps. Uh, so it would be leaving this habitat lifeboat. Here's another example in Doug for up in Canada. Uh, so that's a clear cut with reserves, but it would be very difficult to tell that's not a seed tree with reserves. So, you know, we just talked about seed tree with deferment. That gets easy to understand, just leave the seed trees. But with a seed tree with reserves, what you could do is you do the seed tree cut. So you've left maybe five or 10 trees per acre, but you left all the trees in that little reserve area. Then you come back in in a second harvest, you remove all the seed trees, but you still leave all the trees in that little reserve area. Now it looks like this, okay? So that would be an example of what a seed tree with reserves would look like and how it would work. This is from a research study. Um, if you're managing for aesthetics, you probably do not wanna go cutting dice into hillsides. I don't know, unless, you know, down in the valley, there's a casino or something, but um, but there's just an exa different examples in this study in Doug Fur out in Oregon, where they tried different levels of structural retention, 40% aggregated, 75% with patch cuts, 15% dispersed, 15% aggregated. And this kind of shows you why the terminology is so nebulous. Top left, that's clearly reserves. They've reserved 40% of the stand. You would call that a clear cut with reserves. If you have those dispersed trees you're retaining in the bottom right, 15% of them, what would you call that in the bottom right, maybe? Seed tree. So they're leaving those trees. They're not coming back and harvesting them. They're retaining them. So you could call that a seed tree with reserves, but what else does it look like? That looks just like the deferment systems we've talked about, okay? So here they're keeping 15% of their trees, but because they've dispersed them like that, what they've basically done is a seed tree with deferment. So you can see the terminology gets kind of nebulous. And then that photo in the bottom left, see where the blue arrow is pointing to those open patch cuts? Once you're above 50% retention, then when you look at that, that is a better fit for terminology like patch clear cutting uh, that we'll get into a little bit later, or that could match patch selection that we're gonna talk about next week. So you might not even think of that as a reserve system because they've reserved so much. Look at the top right. Okay, there's 15% aggregated versus the bottom right, 15% retained. So you might call the bottom right one a seed tree with deferment, 
But the top right, you would call a seed tree with reserves, right? If they had used seed trees in that area and then removed them. So that, that could be showing you a, a difference between seed tree and deferment, seed tree and reserves. And again, the terminology is not fixed here. So the important thing is that you understand what the objectives are and how all the different harvests are gonna get you to your objective. Here's an example of a seed tree with reserves. They'll remove those seed trees in the middle. And in this case, their reserves are just on the edge of the stand. And then here's, again, you know, I showed you that clear cut with reserves and talked about how it could be a seed tree with reserves. That photo, again, was regenerated seed tree with reserves, but just as easily could have been a clear cut with reserves when you're walking into the stand at this point, unless you know the history of that stand, right? Um, so they end up looking very similar by the end. Here's an example of a shelter wood with reserves, uh, where you can see the trees reserved in those two patches, uh, and then they'll go in and they'll remove most of that overwood that's well distributed throughout the stand. Um, if they left that overwood, then it kind of becomes a seed tree with the, or shelter wood with the fern, right? So, and here's an example uh, with red pine and white pine in Minnesota. Um, and so you can see in the background there, they've got some reserves out there kind of at the distance. You've got the shelter wood before the establishment cut in the foreground. And so you get a little bit of both out there. And again, you can retain lots of other structures. You can create tip-up mounds, you can retain them, you can push trees over to create down woody debris, you can leave trees up to create snags, you can dead, deaden live trees and leave them standing to create snags. It all depends on your objectives there. So lots of different options there. Okay, so what I wanna do for the rest of class here um, is sort of, you know, a lot of those examples were for out west and then some of what I was talking about was Appalachian, Northeast. And that's because you really don't see a lot of these as widely deployed in the South, which is why I don't have a bunch of Southern examples for you. But what I wanna do is look at what we've already been doing and look at how we can modify what we've already been doing in class here to build in some of these same concepts in a way that may be more realistic and more applicable in our region. And so last Friday, I believe I emailed you that wildlife friendly pine plantation extension uh, publication. It's about eight pages. Um, if you don't have that link, you can just Google wildlife friendly pine plantations. It'll come up. Um, it's an extension publication out of the NC State system. And so um, often when students get to management plans, I have them coming back and asking me questions about exactly this. Um, and you know, I'll send them a link again to that same publication because it really covers everything well. So what the idea is, we know 22% of our landscape is plantations, okay? Um, and on industry land, we saw that this week in lab, they're managing for financial gain, that's their focus. But if you have private landowners with plantations, often they do want a lot of timber revenue off those, but that's not their only objective. If you have a landowner with two or 300 acres, they often have secondary objectives on there. So what we want to look at here is how you take different phases of the rotation in boilerplate pine plantation silviculture, like what we did in lab on Tuesday, and how you tweak them. So you still get timber, but you're not maximizing financial gains and you get wildlife habitat structures as well. So if we start an establishment and work our way through the rotation, and I'm going to go through these kind of quickly because all of this is out of that publication. So you can look at that um, later and you know, take your time going through it. But you can do a lot of different stuff at establishment. A lot of these recommendations at different phases of the rotation are going to talk about backing off on your herbicide prescriptions so that you get more different species out there uh, that may serve food, cover, other needs for different species of wildlife. You can think about how you're spacing it. You can think about the species you're planting. You can think about underplanting different herbaceous species. A lot of what we'll go over here is going to focus about getting prescribed burning out in pine plantations more because that has a lot of wildlife benefits. So plan that from the beginning, put in fire breaks right when you start so you can prescribe burn throughout the rotation. As we move to intermediate treatments, you see some of those things reflected again, where we're talking about fire here. Uh, but then on addition to that, modify your thinning regimes. Thin to a lower basal area, thin more frequently, thin more often. And so with all that thinning, you're trying to move that stand into a condition more analogous to understory reinitiation, 
where now you end up with all these different browse and forage species in the understory. Mid-rotation, think about what you do with your fertilizer and herbicide. If you're fertilizing the stand, keep in mind high rates of nitrogen can prevent legumes from masting. And so that's one consideration. And then with those herbicides, if you have a weed that's causing you a big problem, you open a stand, something like that, control that, but you don't need a tank mix with three different chemicals in it that's gonna give you really broad spectrum control. Try to back off on the tank mixes uh, so that you're putting herbicides out there that you know, aren't gonna have as big an effect on your understory community. Um, and then again, think about modifying your rotation. Go on a longer rotation. We could thin a stand more than two times if we put it on a longer rotation. You could take a stand out to 40 years and thin it four times if you want, okay? Um, and with each of those entries, you're getting more and more into understory reinitiation. Um, you know, think about how you can open up patches, strips, retain some dead trees, lots of different things you can do in terms of the rotation length. And then when you get to your regeneration treatments, okay, don't think about making the cleanest site you possibly could. Leave slash, leave slash in piles if that meets your wildlife species objective, okay? Um, wind rowing was often prescribed as a treatment where you were creating these long linear piles of woody debris, but that was for wildlife. You would get lots of rodents in there that would bring in, you know, other animals to eat rodents, so on and so forth. Um, your SMZs are 50 feet wide, right? That's the minimum recommendation. You can make them 100 feet wide, okay? If you've got a blend of objectives, make bigger SMZs. That may make sense. Uh, don't do big clear cuts. Make a patchier landscape by making smaller clear cuts. And then as we start thinking about managing that whole landscape, you know, if you have a landowner that has 10 stands, you don't have to get everything on one stand, okay? Uh, have it set up so they've got early successional areas, but they're near mature SMZs, they're near mid-rotation plantations elsewhere, mature plantations. So somewhere on the landscape, the wildlife species has the right habitat, and as you move through time, that habitat is always out on the property. It just shifts where it is, okay? If they need a recent clear cut, if that's the right habitat for a species, if you're clear cutting every three or four years, there's always that habitat out there. It's just here one year, two years later, it's over there. It just moves around the property. So uh, maintain all those different stand types and stand ages and stand structures all on the property. And so it might look like this, you know, where you've got different forest types all on the same property. Here's the same idea where you have a landscape with mixed uses all out there. So, so again, that was pretty quick, but it's all in the publication. So what I want you to do now, um, I've got some habitat suitability indices for you. Um, you know, some of you are already probably familiar with them from your wildlife classes. And so if you look in the first few pages of these HSIs, what they show you is uh, the habitat requirements for that specific wildlife species. So if you're unfamiliar with the species, flip through these um, and you'll see what they need. It'll tell you exactly what they need. Um, and then what I want you to think about is say you're a consulting forester, you're working for this hypothetical landowner, this is a thought experiment. And so this landowner has an acreage you can make up, 1,000 acres, 100 acres, uh, whatever you think makes sense. That, that acreage that they have, it's primarily in pine plantations. They want to keep it primarily in pine plantations. Timber is their objective, but they also really love whatever specific wildlife species your group gets, and they want the pine plantations modified or some area on their property modified so that they can get that species present and hopefully abundant on their property, okay? Um, so think about how you can modify the pine plantation. And if you look at your wildlife species and there's just no way to modify a pine plantation, start thinking about the landscape scale on that property and other things that you may be able to do. Okay. Any questions on this exercise? Okay. Um, so y'all can split up into five groups. I've got five of these HSIs for you. Um, and so uh, I think I forgot my HSIs for deer and turkey today, sorry. Uh, but what I have for you is pine warblers, eastern cottontails, fox squirrels. You got a quirky eccentric group of landowners here. 
Uh, you've got one interesting landowner, they want red spotted newts. Um, and then bobcats. So, so go ahead and split into groups, get five groups, and then pick one of these HSIs that's of interest to you. Um, so that, that was just a simple exercise, thought exercise there to show you, you know, and apply everything we've been going over all day. But with these two age systems, the most important thing is the landowner objectives. You start there and you just figure out what you can operationally do within all your constraints that's gonna achieve the landowner's objective. Um, so it's less important about what you call them and it's gonna be more important about how you meet those objectives. So any questions on this exercise or the two aged systems? All right, that's it for today.